This evening, we are very pleased to have with us Sawyer Carnegie. She is going to, as you can see on the screen in front of you, explore with us the history of the African Nova Scotian press tradition and its relationship to black activism in Nova Scotia from 1946 to 1990. Sawyer is a second year MA candidate in the Atlantic Canada Studies program at St. Mary's University. She completed her BA at Acadia in 2017, where she double majored in English and Gender Studies. That's a robust background. At Acadia, working under Dr. Claudine Bonner, she became interested in African Nova Scotian newspapers. Sawyer was born and raised in London, Ontario, and has ancestral ties to Buxton, one of the first free black settlements in Canada. She currently resides in Kajuk, I know I'm going to massacre that, Chibuktuk, on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq or Lanu people. One of my fond memories from very early years at the Nova Scotia archives was Mrs. Oliver coming in from Pictou County and being welcomed into the reading room and sitting there and holding court in a corner of the room. Beautifully dressed, wonderful hat, so knowledgeable. And Sawyer, we're delighted to welcome you to talk about that kind of background and continuity. Over to you, Sawyer. Thank you for that introduction. I will just get my screen up here for everyone to see. If it wants to. Okay, I am assuming we're all good for the screen sharing and you can stop me if it's not. Um, I just wanted to begin, oh, great, okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to begin my presentation tonight um, by honoring Mother Africa, mother of all people, by recognizing the horrors of colonialism and the transatlantic slave trade and the people's call for reparations and that we are here on the unceded territory of the Ilnu or Mi'kmaq people and the long histories of collaboration and intertwined lives of the Ilnu and people of African heritage in Mi'kmaq. And I would also be remiss if I didn't pay my gratitude to Dr. Lynn Jones, an incredible role model, and without her contributions and accomplishments, none of my work would be possible, so. Thank you, Dr. Jones, who I think is here. Um, and yeah, so tonight I'm going to start with some brief discussion of um, some integral definitions to my presentation and to my work. Um, and then I'll cover the timeline of black newspapers from Nova Scotia, sort of the quick and dirty version. Um, and from there, I'm going to highlight the strong link that I believe exists between some of these newspapers and Black activism. So, love that for me. Oh, perfect. So, um, the, the definitions that I want to go over, I like to go over them whenever I talk about my work and my research. Um, I like to highlight the difference between advocacy and activism 
and explain that my choice to call these newspapers activism is entirely intentional. So uh, like a true English major, I take my definitions from the Oxford English Dictionary and I've just highlighted where activism is defined as the policy of active participation or engagement in a particular sphere of activity versus advocate, uh, which is a person who pleads for or speaks on behalf of another. Um, when I started this research, this question, are, new, are Black newspapers activism, are Black newspapers um, advocacy came up a couple times. And um, hi, Lynn. <laughs> Thank you for coming tonight. Um, so I just like to get ahead of it and uh, really highlight that I use the word activism intentionally um, because to me, these the existence of these papers is 100% activism. Um, I see the papers and the people behind them taking an active participation in the world of media and discussions of race and race relations in the province. Um, and I don't think that they're just speaking on behalf of someone or something. So I just wanted to get that out there. And now we can begin with um, the first black newspaper in Nova Scotia. It was the Atlantic Advocate and it was started in 1915. Um, the founders, which you can see on the screen there, they included influential black people in Halifax at the time. Um, and the content of that paper, there are only four surviving copies left. They're at the Acadia archives. Um, but from reading those, you can see that the content pertained a lot to World War I, the number two construction battalion, um, prohibition and accomplishments of black Nova Scotians. And then from there, uh, we see the Gleaner, which was published in 1929 in Sydney by F.A. Hamilton, who was a lawyer at the time. Um, there's only one surviving copy, which the in full, this is just the front page, um, which is at the Beaton Institute. And so because of that, I don't really know the publication length. And whenever I talk about the Gleaner, I like to say if anyone has any, um, tucked away in their basement, in their attic. There are, there are lots of people who would like to see them. <laughs> so, and that goes with any of the newspapers I mentioned tonight. I always like to say, we're always looking for um, more copies, different newspapers, because this, I believe, isn't an exhaustive list just because of the way uh, record keeping has been with, African Nova Scotian publications. So the next one, the most well-known, the most, uh, the best documented one is the Clarion, which was started by Carrie Best in New Glasgow in 1946. Um, originally before 1946, uh, Carrie Best was publishing a church news bulletin that turned into this newspaper uh, after the Biola Desmond incident. And so this is where we see um, newspaper, African Nova Scotia newspapers shifting into that explicitly activist role. Um, in many places, Carrie Best has said that this is an explicit, an explicitly, um, activist newspaper and it was, oh, spoiler, uh, it was, um, sorry, she started it in collaboration with the NSAACP, which was an activist organization. Um, and she really focused on publishing stories 
about black people for black people and covering giving different giving a different voice to um stories in the mainstream media that might not have been covered or um giving a different viewpoint on them and um like bringing back agency to the African Nova Scotian community in the ways in which they're portrayed in the media, which is huge. And then we have the Black Express, which came about in 1978 in Halifax. It was published by Charles Husbands, um, who was a Black railway porter. And this was actually distributed nationwide. And then I like to end on the Black United Front publications because there were many. These are just two of them. Um, personally, these are the ones that I am the most interested in. I think because I know the least about them. I always, in the archives so far in my research, I see one newspaper name mentioned and then I see another one mentioned and then you don't really know when it started and you don't really know when it ends. So again, I'm sure there are people here who were around when some of these were published. They may have copies. I'm super interested in these. Um, so the publications included um, by the Black United Front, there was Black Horizons, The Wrap, which is pictured and the grasp, which is also pictured, which I'm pretty sure was the longest running um, BUF publication. Correct me if I'm wrong. I am always open to learn. Um, again, yeah, I'm very interested in how these seem to come and go and there's not a lot of consensus on timelines or, um, who was writing what. So that was sort of the quick and dirty timeline of Black publications in Nova Scotia. Um, so again, what makes these publications a form of activism? Um, like I mentioned before, these papers are taking active participation in the shape of media in the, sorry, in the sphere of media and race relations. Um, and I, as an example of that, this is a, an article from the Clarion um, talking about Jim Crow practices in New Glasgow. And so especially with the Clarion, you see these stories that pertain to black people disseminating information, important information, like this article would be super important to keeping people safe, um, that you're not getting in other forms of media at the time. And instead of just having word of mouth, you're able to cover more ground um, quicker. And so these papers were written by Black people for Black people and filled a void in mainstream media by covering stories that white outlets neglected while also providing a counter narrative to mainstream media's coverage of events pertaining to Black communities such as the Viola Desmond trial. Um, like I mentioned earlier, part of that motivation to have the clarion and cover the Viola Desmond trial from beginning to end was that it wasn't getting um, the proper coverage that it, sh it deserved, obviously. And you can see how a story like that would obviously be, or obviously could be, um, reported in a way that maybe wasn't truthful or um, super kind to Miss Desmond. So often um, when I talk about my research, 
I'm asked why black newspapers don't exist to the same extent as they used to. And this isn't a question that I'm specifically looking to answer in my research, but especially after the events of this summer, I've been thinking more and more about activism and what it looks like. Um, so I do have some theories and generally my answer alludes to the death of print culture and the movement to online congregations. And I'm aware of the dialogue around uh, the usefulness or effectiveness of hashtag activism. And that's absolutely not what I'm talking about here. Um, I'm talking about the online connections and spaces that have been created by Black people for Black people um, across all walks of life. And I would assume that some of you attending tonight found out about my talk from one of those spaces. So there are spaces like the Objective News Agency started by King's College journalism grads in 2018, or even just Facebook groups or Twitter spaces. The activism, the black activism, sorry, in the mainstream media has not evaporated. It has just shifted and evolved. Events like the Black Lives Matter protests from this summer, pictured here, um, I took that picture on Spring Garden, um, have, they would have looked very different without those online black spaces, which also, like I said, contributed greatly to my audience tonight. And with that, I would like to emphasize the role of the community in this research and in my project. I stand on the shoulders of family record keepers and community archives. And I would just like to express my deep reverence and gratitude to the African Nova Scotian community without whom I wouldn't be able to do any of this research. Um, And again, I am always open to talking with community members. Um, if I have something wrong, if I don't know about a paper, um, this research really has sort of been like following breadcrumbs or like sifting through papers that might not be relevant to newspapers and like finding a mention of a paper and then trying to track it down. And so I am absolutely always open to have a dialogue about it because I love newspapers and especially African Nova Scotia newspapers. And I just feel like it's so, so important that, um, these newspapers and publications are preserved and are understood and are appreciated as um, not just not just something that you know chronicled the daily lives of African Nova Scotians, which is extremely important, but also chronicles things like um, Jim Crow restaurants in um, New Glasgow, the Viola Desmond trial, you know, adding agency back into that community where when you look at mainstream publications, it's just not there. And that's why this research is so important to me um, and to close, I would like to take a page out of Carrie Best's book, who in, uh, in her autobiography, she said that she leaned heavily on the poets of her era for moral support. And um, if you've read her autobiography, um, sorry, I have it right here. <laughs> um, it is filled with poetry. And so I would like to end with um, 
on this inauguration day, the powerful words from Amanda Gorman's poem. In conjunction with the Washington Post's motto, democracy dies in darkness. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. So thank you for listening to me today. And I'm, look, I'm really looking forward to question period. Um, I know I spoke a little quickly. I'm sorry about that. If there's anything that anyone wants me to go back over or expand upon, I have so much to say about this. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to what everyone else has to say about it. So thank you. Great. Um, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, this is Shirley. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Or we may I still be a spot. Yes. OK. Uh, hi. I'm, uh, thanks a lot to Sawyer. And uh, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Shirley Tillotson. I'm the vice president uh, program for the Nova Scotia Historical Society, and I'll be moderating the questions and uh, comments uh, in response to Sawyer today. There's a couple of ways that you can um, get uh, into the queue for uh, questions or comments. Um, you can, of course, uh, use the use your little mouse uh, to look at the reaction to at the bottom of your screen to click on reactions and uh, uh, wave your hand, like I've just done for myself. Um, or you can uh, send me a note in chat. Again, just uh, if you're on some kind of device where you need to look for a menu, there'll be three dots, and you can click on that and get a chat thing. You can type a question in there or just say, I'd like to ask a question. And finally, if either of those things is like too much for you, uh, then when someone else has finished their comment or question, you can speak up. And uh, your, uh, if you know how to unmute your microphone, and um, then we'll be able to hear you. Uh, so three ways to get into the, the queue, either wave your hand or uh, put a chat in or, um, or speak. Ah, and I would like to start off, if I might, where people are uh, sitting around um, thinking about what will they uh, ask Sawyer. Um, Sawyer, I agree with you that the uh, uh, the Black United Front uh, publications from the 60s or 70s are going to be the place where your research is going to, uh, I think, yield a lot of new stuff for people who weren't themselves involved. Uh, and although, you know, I have a kind of like, if I was alive, it's not history, uh, feeling sometimes about history of the 70s. Uh, fact is, you know, I wasn't in uh, Halifax or even in Nova Scotia for a lot of this period. So um, I guess I know you're early on in your research on this, but um, I'm curious about which of those you've had a chance to read. Maybe you could venture kind of, um, story about, uh, I mean, I'd love to know more about how the Africville uh, community meeting, family meeting was reported, for example. Uh, if there's any kind of big event from the 60s or 70s that you've read about in the paper that you can, you, know, you can tell me something about the coverage. Um, so unfortunately, I haven't gotten to read a lot of those BUF publications just from, um, like being unable to access them um, okay. right now, like due to the pandemic, not being able to go into the archives and stuff. Um, I, I have been able to access some of the, um, the this is a plug, the Lynn Jones uh, yes. <laughs> collection yes. at the St. Mary's University archives. Um, a wonderful, wonderful collection that includes so much more than just newspapers, but that is what I focus on. Um, so a lot of the material came from there that I've been able to read. And um, 
Yeah, it's mostly mostly what I have read about those, uh, like the Black family meeting, um, have actually been like meeting notes. Oh, Dr. Yeah. Jones has actual meeting notes in the archives, which are great. And so I have that side of the story, but I haven't experienced the reporting side of it as of- Well, that'll be great to, to have the, uh, often when you're reading newspapers, you don't have both those kinds of sources. So that'll be great. I see uh, Bill Jordan has unmuted himself and turned on his camera. So I'll take that as a sign that he has a question. Over to you, Bill. Number one, I'm feeling guilty that I haven't paid my dues and I'll get that check in the mail. <laughs> but uh, number two, thank you, Sawyer. This is a subject that greatly interests me. I have uh, studied and uh, I think I have some chops with black history. Uh, Gus Wedderburn was a close friend. He is the guy in 1968 that disclosed the bylaw at uh, St. Croix Cemetery in Hans County, which forbid the burial of black people, black and indigenous people. And he stumbled upon a story about a little girl named Rosalie States. And he was so outraged when he uh, came across this story and, and uh, Rosalie's cousin, I think, is a member of the Historical Society, and you can ask him uh, more yourself if you're ever following this up. But uh, the Globe and Mail front page story that Gus communicated to them, uh, in effect said, cemetery bylaw uh, for uh, denies uh, black burials. And Gus lit the fuse with public indignation with the quote, I, I'm paraphrasing, he's deceased now, but the quote is something to the effect that uh, you, the, you discriminate against us in life and now you do it in death. And there was such an outpouring at that time that uh, the bylaw was rescinded that night, that following night. Um, it carried on for months, but um, I'm just going to, I, I don't want to take up more time questioning because I have lots of information I could feed you that seems to be omitted in your talk. But I'll start by a book by a couple of white guys from BC called uh, The Fosty Brothers, George and Daryl, uh, 19, no, 2007 Indigo Press called Black Ice. That story is about the colored hockey league of the Maritimes. And uh, what it will tell you is that a guy named James Kinney, who had a lot to do with uh, everything from uh, the Back to Africa movement to the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children, et cetera, he founded a very successful professional hockey league that played to integrated crowds on, on the East Coast of this country and the States. They were substantial crowds. The story I remember from that book, um, many sto stories, um, they had rinks in Halifax, um, Preston, uh, Summerside, and Sturl, and so on. Anyway, um, James Kinney was uh, such an advocate for his league that he followed press coverage very closely. And he noticed that the white press was not covering the games fairly and accurately. And he indignantly wrote a letter to, uh, I think it was a Chronicle Herald, you'll have to check the book. But that letter um, ignited an outrage, a racial outrage here in Halifax, because Kinney was well regarded. And there was some one quote in the book, if he'd been white, he would have been mayor. He was a magnetic, charismatic guy and what happened with that letter was the city council with its racist background and Africaville is one footprint of many that our city council should be ashamed of and will be forever. But that episode resulted in the cancellation of rink use by the Colored Hockey League. Now that league started in 1895 and it went through to 1929. I don't mean to lecture about the hockey end of it, but the James Kinney 
story. Sorry, yes. uh, he was a, he he was an employee of um, Stairs, Sun and Morrow, uh, ship chandlers, and he was. Uh, uh, one of the prominent uh, black businessmen who uh, actually had a majority white labor force working for him. So uh, people paid so, attention to what he said and they thought, uh, oh, James Kinney and the Colored Hockey League is a good thing, but uh, how dare they attack us, uh, the white population, with uh, a criticism about the coverage of their sport. Now, so, you have Bill, I think you've given uh, Sawyer uh, quite a lot of material to respond to there. So I'm going to okay. ask her to uh, let us know if she can uh, uh, speak to that. Email me. Email me. I, I'm just going to put on one more question, and that has to do with the, the Carrie Best story. Carrie's, uh, Carrie's background was a race riot in New Glasgow. And I'm just wondering if, if that occurred in 39 or 49 after Viola Desmond's episode, because okay. I think that's what ignited the clarion. Okay. Good luck to you, Sawyer. It was a great evening. And uh, rhalifax1 at gmail.com is my email. So uh, let's stay in touch. And uh, you've got something to go with there. Great. Thanks, well, Bill. Of One last thing NFB film uh, with Rocky Jones and uh, Lynn, of course, knows all about this, but uh, the director of that film won an Oscar, not for Kawacha House, but for work he did later. But that's one heck of an instructive film about the 1968-72 yeah. uh, essential period in black history and media history in this province. Thanks, Bill. Sawyer. Well, that's a lot to respond to. <laughs> um, I don't need to respond to all of it, but uh... the part that, like, um, that I know most about, probably, um, I the Gus Wedderburn. Um, obviously, I'm familiar with him, and the um, the burial debacle. Um, it's actually, again, another plug, it's actually um, covered very extensively in the Lynn Jones collection. There are a lot of clippings um, regarding that incident. And yeah, I'll absolutely send you an email and we can talk more about everything. Again, um, I think you're on the right track. Uh, media has activism because th that's what has happened with the media and the black population of this province. Absolutely. Uh, since at least uh, 1895 and Booker T. Washington came to Halifax and piled on the, the Colored Hockey League and the Maritime so-called at that time. Mm -hmm. It was so popular. So, so I, I, I don't know whether Afua you are you have unmuted yourself because you have a question or comment yeah i i have both i think it's right. uh i think hi, it's, hi i think both of them are questions hi everyone hi sawyer that hi. that's a very um insightful talk thank you for doing it i have two two questions if the first is could you elaborate more on the ins and outs of the Atlantic Advocate. Uh, there are, as you mentioned, four issues that are extant. So that four is, is kind of nice number. Four gives you a feel of what the newspaper is about. And if you could talk too about the, the founders and the editors and the publishers, because we just see these people, we don't know who they are. Um, and it, it published for a while, The Advocate. Uh, so that's the first question. And the second and last question is, if you're able to do any comparative work um, with the Black newspapers in Ontario during any section of the time period that you're looking at, because Ontario, of course, has this um, continuous newspaper, Black newspaper publishing history. Thank you. Thank you, Afua. So yeah, the Atlantic Advocate, um, there are four physical copies at the Acadia University archives as well 
I think I'm they're online at the Nova Scotia archives. Yeah. Um, the editors, let me just pull that up and talk about them. They were, oh. so the, or should I share my screen and then we can all look at them? Sure. Okay. See if I can handle this. Nice. Oh. So there, the, um, yeah, so this is from the first or the earliest copy. So the, the cover that is beside it is from 1917, but this uh, editor's page is from a 1915 uh, version. So there's George Roche, M.F. Gemmett, uh, Mrs. Miriam DaCosta, W.A. DaCosta, and William Thomas. So um, they're, um, they're, sorry, they were uh, publishing this out of um, I think the address was 58 Gottingen Street. It was MF Gemmett's um, home. And um, I know that there is extensive research on MF Gemmett um, outside of his newspaper um, endeavors. Um, but yeah, so there were, um, one of them was a lawyer, one of them was a doctor, and they, the advocate spoke heavily to um, Christianity and um, prohibition. Um, I usually say that the content seems to align itself more with the politics of respectability, uh, if we're familiar with that. And it is interesting because these people were all um, Caribbean immigrants to Halifax and they're the ones that started the first black newspaper. Whereas like you mentioned, Ontario has a much longer history with black newspapers um, that goes back farther uh, than Nova Scotia, which I, also think is interesting um, given that Nova Scotia has the oldest black population in Canada. And your question about comparative work, I would love to do some comparative work between um, content in black newspapers in Ontario, black newspapers in Nova Scotia, but I think that's sort of outside of the realm of my uh, masters at the moment. So maybe in the future, if I continue, <laughs> if I continue my research, then that would be something I would like to cover. I realized coming into my thesis that there was so much I wanted to do and I had to narrow it down so much. <laughs> um, so yeah, I do have like a lot of questions and interests about the black press in Nova Scotia and its relation to the black press across Canada or even um, down into the Caribbean, but um, I have to narrow it. Focus. Narrow yeah, it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that okay. answered your question. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Amazing. It's, it's awesome. Good. Thank you. Great, thanks. I have a queue now of uh, four people. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure what order they came in, uh, but uh, uh, and Lynn Jones, you're on there, but uh, you're you're muted currently, and I'm not seeing you. So, oh, look, there you are, Lynn. Uh, if you are, uh, if you can unmute yourself, you've got the floor. Ah, look, there you are. 
<laughs> I, I didn't really have a question, but since you uh, since you put me on, I will. I just uh, this is wonderful, Sawyer. I knew you were doing this research, and I thought, yay! Because <laughs> um, I actually love digging into um, um, old uh, newspapers, and in fact, um, was reading uh, one of the grasp. Mm -hmm. Uh, newspapers that you have there that has a speech by um, Reverend Donald Scare at uh, one of the first meetings of the Black United Front where he was uh, called in to be, uh, he, he was invited to be on the board. Reverend Donald Scare, for those that would remember, he was um, a very um, important and influential minister in Nova Scotia with the Atlantic United Baptist Association and preached in all of the Prestons. But there's a speech there where he um, talks about um, the realities of Black Nova Scotia and he gives lots of warnings to the Black community to be careful about. And I thought it was so fascinating because he had insight into the issues we're dealing with today around land development, um, uh, um, uh, uh, politics, and what have you. So I'm actually formulating something from that to do an event to uh, talk about, oh, so, so you think things have changed. <laughs> Absolutely, and that's what we always talk about. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to m mention quickly, uh, where, or where, I don't know, were they outside of your dates? I don't think so, because there was two other newspapers that come to mind, yeah. which was um, Monitor, which mm -hmm. was written, published with um, Daryl Gray, and also the underground uh, paper called June the 8th in the Black community, which all the copies are in the collection, all the issues of the June the 8th. We, we couldn't find them. I, I remember when Dr. Bonner was uh, doing her work, I told her, they're in there, they're in there. And we did find them, all five issues. So those are two uh, publications that I can think of off the top of my head. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am aware of both of those. And I did learn from you about the um, secretive nature of June 8th, which I am very interested in and the, the whole idea that no one really knows where it came from, like who published it, it just showed up. Um, I love that. So I didn't really know where to plot it down as there's, a, again, like a lot of this air of mystery around it that I'm hoping um, I'm able to sort of nail down some more facts about it uh, with my thesis. Um, but yeah, I'm absolutely aware of those two other publications. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we do have others in the list, but thanks, uh, Lynn. I see you've muted yourself. Okay, on to the next. Uh, Anne-Marie, Lane Jonah. Anne-Marie, are you with us? Unmuting, unmuting. Yes, look, there she is. Endeavoring to unmute. <laughs> I, I, Sora, Sawyer, I just wanted to say what a great talk. So fascinating. Yeah. And um, one thing I was curious about was perhaps um, with, with these publications, um, uh, how were they distributed? Uh, like, were there subscriptions, subscription lists, or was it a community effort that distributed them and did they manage, do you know if they got sort of spread further throughout Nova Scotia or were they concentrated locally? So that's something that I would absolutely love to find as a subscription list to any of these publications. Um, I haven't come across any, but I do know, like when you look at, especially the Clarion, um, a lot of there are many, many issues online of the Clarion um, at the Nova Scotia archives. And you can see that um, the addresses at the top um, of where they got mailed to the 
subscribers. And so you also see when you're reading through the advocate, um, you can buy them um, like one at a time, or you can pay a dollar for like a subscription. And so there was some sort of subscription service. It would get put in the mail. Um, I just haven't, as of right now, I haven't come across any um, lists. Like I would love that. I would love, that's one of the big questions I have about these publications is um, the reach, like who's reading them? Um, how far are they going? Because at the moment, I don't have any way to um, discern that information. So yeah, there's always more you want to know than you can find, but um, I, it is fascinating. This is really wonderful. Thanks so much for that, Sawyer. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Um, and I, before I go to the next person who I know is on my list, I just want to check in with someone named Denise, who has had herself unmuted for a while. But Denise, I don't know if you're trying to get a question in. OK. I'm thinking not. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, just haven't gotten that uh, clear. But Denise, if you do want to try to uh, get in touch, you can use the chat to uh, um, speak to me and I'll uh, put you in the list. So uh, John Reed. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, first of all, sorry, thank you uh, so much for a really interesting talk. Um, I have a, a question. Um, I'm not quite sure if there is an answer to it, but um, uh, one thing that interests me, particularly about the 1970s, uh, which would be the era of the Black United Front publications, uh, it's also the era of uh, what was, would be known at the time as the alternate press, and particularly in Halifax, uh, the Fourth Estate. Now, it's a long time since I read seriously the Fourth Estate, but my recollection is that it did cover stories that um, really would need some kind of journalistic reach into the African Nova Scotian community. So what I'm wondering is, uh, do you have any evidence of sort of um, intercommunication or perhaps journalists going back and forth between the, the, the press that you're primarily interested in and a publication like The Fourth Estate? So actually, um, at the very beginning of this research, when I was working with Dr. Bonner, um, we came across this newspaper and it was called The People and we didn't really know um, like who it was by, who was doing it. And so we ended up contacting the editor and he was the same editor for The Fourth Estate and The People was a very short lived newspaper. Um, that happened before the fourth estate. And um, we thought originally it had been an African Nova Scotian newspaper because the um, front page of the people, I love, it's probably one of my favorite archival things. It says blacks press for change um, across the front. And um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought. I um I like have the like big <laughs> the big uh, newspaper thing because it's so moving and I love that. I really wanted to call my thesis "Blacks Press for Change" because that pun is just incredible. Um, but no, the editor informed us that he that they were a white organization, but that they did uh, routinely cover um, events in the black community during that time. I'm not sure to the extent of like people writing for the same papers. Um, but yeah, there definitely was um, that presence of fourth estate like papers that did cover the black community. Um, uh, the people being one of them. But yeah, as for similar journalists, like I can't, uh, I can't speak to that. 
Yeah, well, it may be it may be difficult to to get at that, depending on the quality of the records. But it, it does strike me as an interesting kind of possible crossover. And in, in the event that um, you know you do at a later stage expand your research, um, might also be interesting. So sort of asking the same question in New Brunswick about the mysterious East and uh, the degree to which again that might. Uh, might uh, connect with uh, African New Brunswick communities as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, John. Um, okay, the speaker's queue is now getting empty unless uh, Bill Jordan was uh, had his hand up, but he's gone now, I think. Um, so the, uh, there is an opportunity here. If people have thoughts or questions they'd like to uh, share with or ask uh, Sawyer. Shirley, David Stinson. Oh, hi, David. How are you? Yeah. Oh, good, how are you? Very good. Um, two things. Uh, Dr. Dr. Best's collection, uh, that is at Yale University. So Sawyer could check the uh, library at Yale University to see you know, whatever other uh, information she might want to find out how it got started, et cetera, it might be in her collection. But I, I know Robin Wink was able to get her to send the collection to Yale University. So that would be important for her to know. The other thing is the Jet Journal, it, it was done by Percy Paris. She might mm -hmm. want to get a hold of Percy, who lives in Sackville. Um, you know, like he mostly has copies of the original stuff. But I don't know if anybody's got a hold of him to, to check into it. But he he lives in Windsor Junction, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't. Um, I know of the Jet Journal and of Percy Paris. I haven't been in contact with him the, though. And I was aware of um, Dr. Best's uh, collection being at being in at Yale um, and trying to figure out. Yeah, the only thing I want to mention is the Fourth Estate. I've seen copies of that, original copies at the Dartmouth Public Library. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. Thank Thanks, you. David. Yeah. You never know what uh, uh, community memory will uh, turn up by way of uh, fresh leads. Yeah. Uh, do you know us uh, wanting to ask a question? I just wanted to make a comment. I think some of the Fourth Estate is on the Nova Scotia Archives website. Yes. Digitized, yeah. partly searchable. So yeah. you might want to check there, Sawyer. And that was such an interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. This might be last call. Uh, this is Lynn. I'm Hi, just Lynn. Hi, I'm just wondering if magazines fit into your research along with the newspapers. Um, I thought about including magazines because I am aware of um, at least a couple magazines, Copper Tone being one of them. Um, I just found for the scope of my project, it was hard to include magazines and then um, the way that I would like to do the content analysis, magazines and newspapers have, um, at least like from what I've seen of Copper Tone, it has such a different um, content that it would be hard to sort of have them all together. If that answers. Thank you. No problem. Others, questions, comments, research leads. Okay. Uh, I think uh, uh, we will, uh, of course, be posting uh, the recording of this evening's session, uh, the talk part of it on uh, our YouTube channel and Facebook. And Sawyer, if you keep an eye out on uh, on those uh, pages, you'll be able to field questions or comments that might uh, come up to people uh, later on. Uh, so uh, those of you who 
want to get her onto a certain track while the research is still young, we'll have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, our next uh, meeting will be in the third week of February. And I see one of the two presenters of that uh, session is here tonight. Um, Lindsay McCollum, uh, a faculty member at Mount St. Vincent and her colleague uh, there, Jennifer Brady, will be giving a talk called, Why Would a Girl Want to Be Educated? The History of Home Economics, Post-Secondary Education in Nova Scotia. So uh, that will be another uh, topic of wide interest, I think. And uh, uh, I would like to thank, again, enthusiastically, as so many have, Sawyer for uh, being our first graduate student presenter this year. Uh, we'll have one more, one for colleagues from St. Mary's later in the year. And uh, for taking that risk and putting that uh, uh, new research out there. So thanks a lot, uh, Sawyer, and thank you to all. Uh, Lois, do you have any other closing remarks? No, other than to thank Sawyer, to thank you, to thank all of the people I counted about 50. Thank wow. you for coming to listen this evening. If there's nothing else, I think we are adjourned. Adjourned. Okay. okay. Until yes. next month. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Bye. <laughs>